Great. So it just turned six o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our guest talk this evening with Kenny Collins, who is our artist at the Caton, oh, sorry, the Essex Gallery. Um, so Kenny has been kind enough to go ahead and, and give a guest lecture tonight. And just as a quick review that um, please go ahead and mute yourselves during the talk. And then once she's done her presentation, we'll have a period of time for questions and answers. So when we're doing that, please just go ahead and type your question into the chat and then I'll go ahead and read it off for her to answer, okay? So I will turn everything over to Kenny. Hi, everybody. Do I get to like have a big face or not? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you to Emily. Thank you to Essex. Thank you to, most especially to Nicole for inviting me for this show. Um, um, I'll just jump right in. Um, a lot of you uh, know a little bit about me, but you might learn a little bit more now. This is a how I got here abbreviated story of my life PowerPoint thing, which I've never made before. So I feel sort of accomplished. But anyway, um, I became an artist in a kind of a roundabout way, which you might kind of find interesting. I never ever in my life as growing up until I was about 40 even imagined being a visual artist. So um, the very first thing I did in visual arts, I was actually punished for. I was in Catholic school and our um, Catholic school had no art money or real interest, but they gave you crayons and they gave you white paper. And so I would always grab the big black crayon and make these marks that I thought were just beautiful and intense and wonderful and they thought I was some sort of demon spawn or just kind of a disturbed person so in, when art when the art 15 minutes came up during the day I was sent to clean the erasers so I never <laughs> so that was kind of my first experience with with wanting to make marks on anything and um, but I was good at a lot of other things so I was good at academics I was good at sports I was I had a lot of fun in my life. So I was basically a very happy kid. I didn't have any um, angst about not being able to be an artist or I was never driven to like draw like a lot of people that I know who became artists in their adult years. So um, I just stayed me and did all the things I did. I played football, I read books, I you know had a paper route, I did all those things that a kid, kid did and then it's like, Fast forward to the three days after I got out of high school, I moved to New York City and um, got New York, right? New York in the 1970s. I was 18 years old. It was amazing and, and wonderful. And so I started doing what I had never really done before, which was go to museums. And there I am in what's now called MoMA, which we called the modern back then. And they had a lot of free days. So it was really great and easy to go. And I turn a corner and bam, there's, Franz Klein, right? And I didn't know who Franz Klein, I didn't know anything about art or whatever, but I was just so astonished by seeing this in this obvious setting that I mean, this is a, an artist did that. That's like, it's like, I used to make that when I was a little kid with my crayons. It's just it's like so exciting to see. And there were several of his, his uh, pieces there. So I stayed and I looked. And then of course, there was Robert Motherwell. And um, so I was interested in, Robert Motherwell for a lot of reasons. He started at life more as a philosopher than a visual artist. And he did a lot of, a lot of really interesting writing about the world and, and art in particular. And he had this phrase um, called the shock of recognition where you see something or you do something and it becomes, um, it resonates inside you in a way that nothing ever does. And so that's what these things did, but it never ever even remotely occurred to me that I would, could even do anything like it or that it would be a life to do something like it. So I was still very distant from the idea of being a visual artist. So living in New York in the 1970s during the very first uh, heroin epidemic, I got robbed a lot and I got tired of getting robbed a lot. So I decided to study martial arts and try to figure out how to protect myself. And um, that sent me on a 25 year journey and totally away from any kind of visual arts into martial arts. I studied Aikido for almost 25, 30 years. Uh, this is, there's a little picture of me in behind all those other wonderful Japanese looking people. Um, I stayed in Japan for seven years. Um, I studied mostly Aikido, but also uh, an art called the Todaha Bukoryu, which is um, this, me on the left-hand side there, with this long halberd-like thing. That's me giving a demonstration with my teacher 
uh, sorry for the crappy photo, but it's it was so faded and I had to do what I could with it. So I um, was in Japan till the mid, uh, mid 80s. I came back to the States. I had this life. I was going to be a, um, a martial arts teacher. I had a whole identity. I had everything. Left. And then I got hurt and I couldn't do it anymore. So I didn't know what to do. So I decided, uh, well, why don't I sit down and write about it? And so I started writing fiction and I was nowhere near as accomplished at it as I would like to be. So I said, well, what can I do? How can I become a better writer? And I said, well, maybe if I learned how to draw, I would look at things, I would be patient. I would look, see details more or whatever. So there was, I was living in Howard County and there was the Yellow Pages back then. I looked in the Yellow Pages and there's the Reading Academy of Fine Art. And I figured, give them a call. So I called up, this woman answers and I said, I'd like to learn to draw. And she said, okay. And I said, well, no, no, you don't understand. I'm nearly 40 years old. I've never done anything. I can't, you know, the trite thing, I can't even draw a straight line thing. And she said, well, can you see light? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, can you see shadows? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she said, well, you can draw. <laughs> and so I went to the Reading Academy of Fine Art, which was not too far from my home. And it turned out that during the day, the Reading Academy of Fine Art was the Reading Tool Rental Center. And Mr. Redding's wife, Dorothy Redding, ran the Fine Arts Academy in the evening. So instead of like coming into this artsy world that would have been very intimidating for me, I was drawing hammer drills and snow blowers and pipes and things like that that was so not art in, in my estimation. It was just me trying to be a better writer. But I still had no inkling of becoming a visual artist. So. Um, but then I like, got kind of into it and I started looking at other artists and I would go to the library and get all the books I could carry and then I'd find artists that I liked and um, try to not copy the images but to make something that kind of looked like it with, I'd just go to an art store and buy stuff. I really had no idea what I was doing. And so this is uh, Nicholas de Stahl. He was a very big influence on me and uh, Susan Rothenberg. These two artists were like two of the, the in, in, in the beginning, two of the people that I wanted to be like. If I had to be like anybody, I wanted to be a love child of De Stahl and Rothenberg. You know? <laughs> and so um, I was getting really excited about making these things. And um, I, I still, I didn't call them paintings. I didn't call them anything yet, but I, I got to the point where it was so much more literal fun and excitement to use my body again and get into doing stuff that I just, kind of stopped writing. I stopped writing for nearly 25 years. And um, so it was not only a lot more fun of this, but this, it was actually lucrative. I was able to sell some of these things and make some money back. And, um, and I realized many years later that the training that I got in martial arts was, is what gave me the ability to stick with this and to be patient. And so even though I busted up my body, I really did gain a lot from all those years. So yeah, the moral of that story is you never know what the hell is going to take you where. So just stay on the journey. So I uh, had a job in Howard County. I was commuting back and forth to Baltimore. I had a piece of property in West Virginia. I started making things that I looked at. I, I did a very long, maybe two years, I would make these very abstracted landscapes. This is a rough run. And then I, driving to Howard County through the Harbor Tunnel, I saw these beautiful wetlands and I made multiple, multiple landscape drawings of, you know like this very abstracted and then I found out that it was a landfill that is not this beautiful wetland but there were still a million birds and fabulous beautiful grasses and marshes and all this stuff so I got to not care what it was I was looking at um, but then after a couple of years of this and I had luckily I, I was able to sell a lot of them in different places but I, it got boring doing the same thing over and over and over. And I, I, the last thing I want in my life is to be bored. So, um, but I was terrified to stop because it's the only thing I knew how to do. The only thing that, you know, seemed successful in the world. But I was with the help of Cinder Hipke here, who's here. I was making a garden in my backyard and there were all these amazing things happening and all these plants coming. And the last thing I know anything about is plants or flowers or, you know, I'm just completely not a gardener. But I kept looking at the plants and the, a plant comes from a seed, right? And so where did the seed come from before there was a plant to make a seed? And so I, I just started thinking about the idea of 
generation and where ideas come from, where images come from. And so I started making, so I took all those landscapes that I thought were crappy and didn't want to deal with anymore. And I started drawing and painting on top of them. And I started drawing these circular forms and um, lo and behold, this is sort of the series that launched my career as a visual artist in the outside world. Uh, this work got me into a magazine, New American Paintings, which got me galleries, three or four galleries around the country. Um, uh, got a local gallery. I started making stacked ones, transparent ones all overnight. I just developed a particular facility with certain kinds of materials um, that was uh, that I didn't know I was learning while I was doing it. I just wanted to make these things that look like Nicholas de Sol, essentially. <laughs> and, and um and then there was this very whoops whoa back one very oh that's the other way sorry there was this is a maquette for a piece that i did i got a commission from a art rep in los angeles to do a these were about like eight feet by four feet the three panels uh, and this is the very first time i used technology to to get my work out this is a this was a really bad picture of an email that I sent to these people and um, and it actually turned out that the paintings were going to a hotel in Hokkaido, Japan, where which is the only place I've ever stayed in Hokkaido. So it was, it was kind of this really kind of fun connection of bringing two worlds together. So the moral of this story, the reason I, I'm, I'm talking so much about this series is that what I learned throughout this is that I need to trust what my hands wanted to do. Not to keep trying to make landscapes because I knew I could sell them or people liked them or whatever, but just if I couldn't make landscapes anymore, do what my hands told me to do. And um, that comes to the next series of work that I did, and I still do, are, whoops, I keep going the wrong way, sorry. There we go. Birds, pigeons. I, I live near a park. I walked all over the city. I love the city. I love walking in the city. And I came to be totally enamored of pigeons, sparrows, gulls, all the birds that people that are very ubiquitous that people are not bird watchers kind of say, oh yeah, there's another one. Um, but I, they became my really good friends and I just make birds. I make birds any way I can. I, I find them, I love them. I, um, I, I made a declaration a while back that I'm not gonna make any more birds because everybody I know has five and I can't sell anymore. <laughs> But what um, I can't stop there. I keep finding new ways to make birds. Uh, this was I got real dramatic about this bird, a red knot that I um, follow th through migration routes to my door. Um, and then these are these one of the last pigeons. Sorry, these are my news pigeons. Uh, pigeons made out of newspapers. Uh, his pigeons know all about us and they see everything that we're doing. So what's next? Oh, so I was making money. So I started traveling again and come back with memories. Um, not photographs. I, I don't take photographs, but I come back with memories and I started using different materials. This is joint compound with pigment mixed in it. And this is um, a place Janet Martin knows. Well. This is Hamas Springs, uh, New Mexico, uh, the Inca Trail in Peru. This was a, a tissue paper, colored tissue paper collage. Uh, this is a um, pigment smooshed into wood from a wall in Ravenna, Italy, and then a um, nocturne from Venice, what Venice felt like at night. Uh, and so all, all these things are happening from memory. And then I, of course, went on a jag about what, what is memory? Where does memory come from? And I, having long been away from Japan, I was pretty conversant in Japanese, but I was losing the language. And so I wanted to kind of understand a little bit more about memory and why does memory go away? What do you, what do you keep, what you remember? So I had a a show called anamnesis, which is a Greek word. And my friend Jordan Tierney um, found this bizarre thing on the streets of Baltimore. It was a book, an un it was a book that had been unbound, but was still somehow stuck together of um, teaching braille in Japanese. And um, it just literally came so out of the blue that it was unbelievable. And I wasn't interested in learning Braille, you know, but I would, the pages and the things were so beautiful that I had to do something with them. So I would cut them up and wax them and burn them and, and have this sort of Japanese sense of, of presentation. And um, here you can see a little bit more, see where the Braille is under there. 
this kind of got me into wax and fire in a way that was really exciting because the whole idea of memory evaporating, it was burning away. And uh, But the moral of this story is that the show that I got at School 33 came as a result of a donation I made to their fundraiser, a lot of art. Everybody, every year they gave a prize of a show, a lot of art, and there's a lot of controversy, a lot of difference of opinion about artists donating to fundraisers and things like that. Um, and I understand why it's a good thing, why it's a bad thing, but in my case, I still continue to donate when I can because I believe I like to do it. It makes me feel good. But the reason I got this show and was able to kind of make this work in the way that I did was because I gave a piece to, to a lot of art. So I was always making work or reading and actually making uh, collaborative shows with people about books and things. And I made work, I continued to make work about uh, interpreting words. This is an interpretation of a Rilke, Rainer Rilke poem. Uh, this is Wallace Stevens, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. And most recently I did a coming back from Italy. I, we were in Ravenna where Dante's tomb is. And so there was a whole series I did of uh, mostly the 32nd Canto of the Inferno. Um, and then sometime in the early part of 2008, I broke my arm and I started doing what I could which is file papers and, and find stuff. And um, I realized I had, uh, there was a lot of work that was out in the world that hadn't come back to me or hadn't been paid for, or I didn't know what was going on with it. So I, you know, in a snit, um, I said, well, hell with all of you people, send me back all my work. I, you know, I want it all back. And I realized when I got it all back, it was a lot of stuff and I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And so I said, I, what the thing that made me happiest was when people who really loved what I was doing and, um, got to share my work. And one of the examples of that was when, while my arm was broken and healing, I had this great dog that needed to be walked a lot. And one of my friends who had been a guard at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, um, said, I said she'd walk my dog. And I said, okay, I don't have any money, um, but I'll give you, you know, we can trade for artwork or whatever. And she went, oh, wow, I could get a Kenny Collins painting. And I said to myself, wow, that's stupid. It shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> These are the people that, should have my paintings. And so at, at the point where I got all my artwork back, I said, I'm out of the art market. I'm, I'm over it. Um, I'm going to, from now on, sell directly to human beings. Um, and that's pretty much what I've been doing for the whole time. Uh, there's one gallery I work with in Baltimore, uh, Terry Fleckenstein, because I love her. And, uh, but pretty much everything else I do on my own. I, I get invited, um, luckily, in places. And it kind of you kind of make my own work. Uh, or excuse me, make my own luck in places. Uh, uh, this is some work I did about the Grand Canyon. Again, using fire, I pressed paper and waxed it and burned it. And these are pretty big. These are like five, six feet big. Um, if you ever get a chance to take a river rafting trip on the Colorado and the Grand Canyon, drop everything and do it. Um, just it'll it literally does that cliche thing of changing your life. This is a piece about a rapid. And most of the rapids, you kind of going down the river and you you see it up ahead and oh my God, here it comes, get ready to bail. But this one, <laughs> you're just kind of going and all of a sudden you look like you're gonna run into the damn wall. I mean, you get really close up and personal and the guy spins the, the raft and you go shooting out the other side. Um, and this is a detail of, this is tissue paper that's been uh, painted with inks pressed for a week or so so it gets down to about an inch maybe an inch wide and then waxed on both sides and then burned with a torch so it becomes a real solid thing and um uh, i just love this kind of work i hope to do more of it and so I'm, I'm working on water i'm doing this thing with all this dry stuff this tissue paper and i said well water that's not dry that's not what what do i want to do so i said i want to pour something onto a very slick surface and see what happens. And so this became um, a body of work called Light on Water, which was kind of one of the first more, I don't know, political things I did. I, light on Water was a pun. I wanted people to think about water and how water is used and what happens with it. And um, so I made, uh, these friends of mine gave me their basement to use, which was lovely and very generous. And I made these long panels, just like eight feet by three, four feet, whatever they were, of on 
well, you have to say Duraland. You can't say Mylar, but I just said Mylar, so you're not allowed to say Mylar. But um, what I would do is pour inks and manipulate it and dry it and stuff. And the venue that I was making this for um, had these massively beautiful windows. And I had like seven or eight pieces that were going to hang in this window and the light was going to come behind them and it was going to be cathedral. It was going to be wonderful. But the venue, it turned out that the venue wasn't going to be ready for a very long time and hasn't, I don't even think it is still ready yet. And so I had to figure something out. I needed to do something with these things because they're really hard to store and I wanted people to see them. And so I, lo and behold, found this place, which is amazingly right across the street from my house. It's the second floor garage of Lydia and her baby who were just eating popsicles here. And I didn't know them very well at the time. I think I just met them a few months before that. And uh, um, so I called up at her email and I said, I got this idea. I don't know. It's kind of off there. And, you know, I said, I would need to have like the space for a long time and people would be coming in. And she said, yes. I mean, there was, there was no question. She said, yeah, sure. Come in and do it. And what I needed was windows. And this place had windows all around the sides. So uh, the moral of this story in terms of what happens to you when you're an artist is don't despair if a place isn't ready keep your eyes open something good is going to happen um and then sadness abounded when donald trump got elected and i started feeling our social fabric just being just disintegrated pulled apart pushed apart and i did this series of paintings off the grid uh, grids um where everything was kind of together and then boing, it just got pulled apart. And some of them were more beautiful, even though they were, you know, not congruent. And then eventually the social fabric would just kind of flop away. Uh, but then luckily he went away <laughs> and I was um, with my friend, Becky Bafford. We had a show at Howard Community College uh, about shadow. The show was titled, titled Umbra. And this is a piece that was in that show about, um, this is a codex, this is a book, um, and that the letters that you see on the surface of things are not always the language that it was created by and that the important thing to do with surfacing is look beyond it, to look into the shadows. And that brings us to part and parcel. Um, we can go through the show a little bit if you'd like. I need to see what time it is. Oh, we're good. I got about five more minutes or so. We'll do a quickie through here. This is an image created by Emily Craighead. Thank you very much. Um, one of the pieces in the show is, is called Delta. Uh, actually, let's go back one. Let's leave this up. But part and parcel is a, um, actually began life as a 15th century legal term in England um, that had its roots in real estate, uh, that there were these parcels and there were parts of it and portions of it. And you couldn't have a parcel without the parts. And a part had to be part of a parcel. So that if something was part and parcel of something, it was integral to it, could not be separated from it. And this kind of got me thinking about the, the problems that we've created in the world, having this separation of from humans and what we call nature, and that we are different from not integral to everything around us, which has gotten us into a lot of trouble. Uh, there's a guy I'd like to uh, recommend if you ever want to read, uh, he's a writer and a critic, his name's Howard Rheingold. And uh, Harold Rheingold, um, one of the thing, most important things I ever heard him say was uh, that we should pay attention to what we pay attention to. Is that what, what does our attention get drawn to? What do we, um, how, how is information handed to us, managed, dis, dis, dis for us, but that what we need to do is watch what we watch, is to be aware of what it is that we're paying attention to. So it is a natural human impulse and not a bad one to surround ourselves with beautiful things, to be in beautiful, inspiring places that give us joy and hope and, and life and love, but we, because we see the world simply from a human perspective, many of us, um, we've trashed the world in a lot of ways. We build houses in places where we shouldn't, where we're killing off species, we, uh, and uh, animal and uh, land species and things. And um, we ban birds so that we can 
keep track of them and make sure we know how we're hurting them so that we can fix them. And it's just, there's this odd way that we go about learning about the world and, and dealing with the world that is constantly at odds with the absolute certainty that we are part of the world, not separate from it. So Delta is a piece I'm, I spent lots and lots of years, um, not in New Orleans, but in and around that area uh, as a visitor, a friend of mine had houses and um, we used to sail a lot in Lake Pontchartrain through the Gulf. Uh, and I would go back, I, literally it's 50 years I've been coming and going from that part of the country. And um, little by little, you can see the, the water's coming, uh, the water's rising. Um, so paying attention. And this is a piece that, um, it's about the migration of birds. These are the two, the, north, the Eastern and Western hemispheres, Western and Eastern hemispheres, the other side. And these lines are the roots from the bottom of Tierra del Fuego and, and, and Africa, all the way up into the Arctic and to the Siberian peninsulas and things. And I am a, a bird watcher, I love birds. Um, and migration is one of these particular things that helps me to remember that I am a part and parcel of the, of the universe. So, uh, these birds are made with um, wire and plaster uh, that's been coated with lemon juice and wrapped up in muslin and set on fire. The lemon juice and the fire create these colors. Uh, the bones of the bird, the barbed wire is, I've steeped it for a very long stinky time in vinegar so that it took the shine off of it and created uh, a lot of words. So migration, there are two books, if you're interested at all, I hope you are, in bird migration. This is called Moonbird, which is one of those red knots that I was talking about. The Moonbird is a remarkable, um, what do you call it, a piece, a, a, a remarkable bird that was banded many, many years ago and still shows up. Um, and they call it the Moonbird because it is literally flown from the earth to the moon and back and back to the moon those that many miles in the course of its life so far and nobody knows if b95 is going to show up in cape may again this year but everybody hopes for it so this is a book it looks like a kid's book but it's not it's it's kids can read it but it also has a, a great deal of information imparted in a way that's very understandable and enjoyable and then there's this one that i um highly recommend scott Wiedensall's book uh, world on the wing Wiedensall is not a an academic uh, or he's, a, he's an amateur, he's a lover. The, the Latin word for lover is an amateur. And he, uh, he writes in a very, very, very accessible way about the magic and the majesty of bird migration and the problems that we have in the world because of the way we're treating habitat. Uh, then, with, then I made this series of paintings uh, called Bird's Eye View. There are about 50 or 60 canvases, varying sizes, and on each one, underneath what you see on the surface is a landscape painting, like my very original landscapes. I, got, I wanted to go back to it because it's really fun to do. And then on top of that, I chose um, a color palette and defaced the landscape, uh, chopped it up, did the thing that humans do, gouged it, did all these things. And then I had these 50, 60 things and I started fitting them together like jigsaw puzzles, which is also what humans do is we create totally inane and, and often ridiculous boundaries that have nothing to do with the culture and the language and the, the place that the land is being carved up into. So, and I, if you come to the gallery, you can see I've deliberately hung them low, even for short people. Um, so I want you to like look down on them as if you were one of those migrating birds flying over them. Uh, it's another one of them. And then, the um, going back to my work with uh, text and things. This is uh, there's a small. These are small wooden pieces. There's a 13 panel series um, representing or interpreting a poem by Dylan Thomas, which is the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my green age. And I won't do it. I'm always known to go on and on and recite the whole damn poem, but I won't. Um, it's an amazing poem about interconnectedness. That the force that drives the flower, drives us, that blasts the, oh, don't there we go, that blasts the roots of trees is my destroyer as well. So if you get a chance to read the poem, it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, there's the other one, that's the, that's the final stanza. 
And I just finished a novel about a lot of things, but one of the things it talked about was a person who grew up outside the Judeo-Christian tradition. And um, what would someone in that situation in the United States come to believe? How would they believe things? So um, novels, it's still not done. Things, things, good things might happen with it, might not. But um, I kept thinking of Christian iconographic, the crosses, uh, orthodox. And I wanted to make a new icon. I wanted to make an icon that described how, what I think the world is. And this is a, a Mobius loop. Um, a Mobius loop is this groovy form that falls back on itself. You can't ever get off the loop. You're in it, you're on it, you're, you can't, it, it, it doesn't lose you and you can't lose it. It's a part and parcel of things. Um, and then because I was working with Greek mythology, um, I got really excited and, uh, about the boats that the ferryman, Karen, would take the souls to the underworld. And um, it was a beautiful sense I got that, um, that you're kind of floating away, but you're gonna return on the Mobius loop. So this is another part of the show. And then this is a piece about um, density. It's a, it's a pretty big one. It's like six by six feet or whatever, but, and um, kind of like a tapestry hanging. And it's all about living in the city, that we are so much intertwined and there are so many lines and ways at which we're connected that we have to find some way, some way somehow to live together. And this is a piece about song lines, another way that lines connect and create things. This is a song lines with a book written by uh, Bruce Chatwin about the the first peoples in Australia and they believe that the the land the place came to be by creators by the creators walking the land and singing the songs and so the song lines are um, uh, the way that they view the universe came into being and there's 64 pieces of watercolor paper very, very carefully kind of sewn together on straight lines to show what the Europeans did to the land when they came, which again, chopped it up. But if it, it, you can't see it at all in the picture, but there's also a lot of crazy sewing and lines and things going in a lot of different directions that are at the heart of what the land is. And then I think there might be, oh, and here we go. This is, um, this is 800 shipping tags that have been stamped with the scientific notation for 10 million. And you can count them if you want. I swear to God, there's 800 of them up there. And it represents the 8 billion people that are supposed to be on our planet in, um, I think, 20 or 30 years. We're supposed to have, make it up to 8 billion. And the, it occurred to me as I was dipping these things and my mind was all everything that nobody, nobody that's ever been or ever will be born asks to be born. We're just plunked down here and we got no choice in the matter. We have choices of how to live our lives and what to do with them, but we don't get a chance to say, nah, I'm, I'm opting out. I'm, I don't want to be here. So the numbers of people, the shrinking environments where people are going to be able to live on our planet are going to force us to get drawn together and become closer and closer and closer together um, in a regular pattern and then in a crazed pattern in this way. Uh, um, so uh, I call this piece Exodus and I don't know why. And then I wanted to end the show and my thinking about things um, this is, there's three paintings at the, at the end of the show and they're, they're on a different color background, which I really liked. It was just fortuitous that those paint panels hadn't been painted, but it's this very happy greenish color. And this, these paintings are called A Way Through. And um, there's scars and mars and, and problems and stuff, but there's also a, the proverbial, you know, wonderful light in the, tunnel at the end of the whatever. And, um, and I believe that it isn't going to be easy to get there, but I do believe that it's still possible that there is a way through. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And I am ready to stop sharing. And Nicole, are you back? There she is. I, 
I am here. Um, that was wonderful, Kenny. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, when I had asked you to, to do the exhibition, like I had been drawn to your work visually and I did a little bit of reading about it, but hearing you speak about it gives me even more information. And um, uh, once the talk is over, I've got to chat with you about some stuff. So, um, but in the meantime, uh, it is now open for questions and answers. So if anyone has anything they'd like to ask Kenny to go ahead and um, talk about, maybe answer more or speak more about some aspects of her work or whatever you'd like to ask, um, please feel free to type it in the chat and, um, and I'll read it off to her and then, and then we, can, we can go from there. Um, right now there's just sort of a kudos. It says, congratulations, Kenny. I'm glad you went um, so into depth about the pieces. So, yes, very cool. Um, okay, so this one's from Emily. Uh, she says, thank you. A lot of your processes seem to have an element that you have no control over. Are you ever nervous during these moments? Ner not nervous, I'm excited. Um, I make a lot of stuff I throw away. I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, yeah, the, the process involves um, a lot of, uh, toss it out the window. And, and the one thing that I did learn, actually I've learned through many things, but one of the main places I learned is through the 20 some years we've been doing a monthly creative alliance critique um, is how to assess what you do and, and, and how to assess it honestly. To, to be able to look at your work and say, well, that's a good one. And not stop there, but say, why is it a good one? What about it works? Can you replicate that? Is it something that matters to a whole? Um, so yeah, I, I, it makes me happy when things do something that I'm not expecting. Okay, and um, thank you. Uh, okay, let's see, I was gonna answer in the chat, but I'll just answer out loud. So someone asked, will the recording of the talk be available? And yes, it will. Um, we actually have a YouTube channel for the gallery. So once the um, once we're done with our, our talk tonight, we'll be um, compiling it and then putting it up there. So if someone happened to miss the talk, they could still watch um, after the fact. Okay, let's see. And the next question, how does your art influence or serve your writing and vice versa? Oh, it's gotta be Dana. <laughs> yes, it is Dana. How does it... Um... Actually, I'm, I started learning to draw to be a better writer and it didn't work out in the exact way that I thought, but it did totally work out in the end because I am a much, I have much more artistry in my writing now because I am not editing as I think words, which is I think what I was doing when I was earlier as a writer. I, it's, it's easy to, if you're facile with words, it's easy to just, zip by something important in your head and write down something else. So, so I trust what comes out of my brain more now uh, because of having done visual arts. So. And I don't, I still can't draw very well. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, okay, so let's see. Our next question is um, from Jessica. Uh, thanks so much for your wonderful talk. I loved hearing about all of your influences. I've been thinking a lot about impermanence lately. And when I was watching your talk, I saw this in your work. Is this something that you think about in making your art? Impermanence. Um, yeah, I just turned 69, deg 69 degrees, 69 years old last week. And, um, and I know very, very well that things are impermanent and I'm heading toward the, the end of the, this is act five of my Shakespearean play, but um, everything is impermanent uh, and has value and beauty because of it. It's actually one of the, um, the, the most, the, the, the deepest connection I have to Japanese culture and Japanese arts is the idea of wabi-sabi, that, that things that are ephemeral and impermanent are some of the most important things that we have because they provide us with a, a baseline to understand that we are not. And um, so, yeah, thank you. I, I, I'm glad it came through a little bit. It's, it's, I think it's in everything that I do for sure. Thank you. Next question. Um... Let's see, this is from Christine. I heard you had done multiple materials and techniques like burning 
tissue paper, wax, etc. If you ever expand more from that, what other materials or techniques are you interested in doing? Well, the thing that has kept me interested in doing it at all is that I have no idea what materials I'm going to use. I sort of fit the material to the whatever metaphor that I'm trying to work under or idea, whatever. And um, the only thing I can't do anymore, which I lament, is work with uh, the joint compound is a, a, and pigment and, and coloring it is because it just creates so much dust that I would have to have a studio that I can't have any longer. And But pretty much as long as I can get it up my stairs and into the, the room, I, it, it's all on the table. I'll try anything. Wonderful. It's one of the best things about art is being able to experiment, right? Um, Okay, and next question. Um, I love the unlinearity, sorry, of your thinking. Is <laughs> this is giving me so much to think about? Fabulous work, and I miss seeing you in person at Critique. So the um, K Strauss was the name with that one. Um, okay, next is I would love to hear you recite the whole Dylan Thomas poem. If not right now, perhaps another time. Um, it's it's not short. I don't know. <laughs> time to do it. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe when we edit this thing, I could append it or something like that. Or, or... That would be cool. Yeah, we could do that. Um, we will do that. I'll, I'll get you on a Zoom call and we'll add it to the video. It's also, um, I mean, Google Dylan Thomas, the four step through and you'll get the, the text. It, it's on a bunch of different things. So. All right. It's I, totally worth it. <laughs> I know I'm not supposed to talk. But I'm gonna jump in here anyway, because <laughs> but I would love to do the Dylan Thomas with each, and we can do a slideshow as it goes through with each of the panels. That would be a great video. I'm just gonna throw that out there, and I'm very sorry for interrupting. I just love that idea. No, sorry. that's a great idea. So yes, we will do that. Um, Kenny, you don't have a choice. We're doing it. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, next one is um, once again, Kenny, your thoughts about art and your honesty about your process are so inspiring and so surprising at times. Thank you. Thank you. Given that you don't approach the work with preconceived visions of what it would look like, how did any aspect of this work surprise you? Well, one of the real surprising things was that I never got to see the gallery until I walked in to install it. So I, I had, there was a virtual tour of the previous show, so I was able to kind of map it out in my mind, but not really seeing the work in the space was, um, was one of the biggest surprises. Um, uh, surprise whenever anything that I burn looks like I wanted it to that's always a good surprise <laughs> that's that's always exciting it smells good and also I, I, if you come to the gallery make sure we can't I don't think we could put up a note but I made a bunch of little Mobius strips that I wax for people to take home so you're please if you come take one or take two um, there's plenty of them there and I would love for you to have a something to hold on to so. Uh, next question um, from Linda is, even knowing you since the early seed period, I am still in awe of your work and your incredible breadth of thinking. Can't wait to see the show. Oh, good. All right. Oh, and then the next one from Lydia is a poem. Oh, she gave the force through the green. Cool. Um, so if anyone wants to, to see that, you can just click on the link that Lydia provided, which is awesome. And then um, the last question I have so far is, um, have you tried to make a painting of a Zen, forgive me, koan? I, I might've said koan. that wrong. Koan, thank you. No, uh, no. Uh, to make a painting of a koan, I just did. Ha, no, I don't know. <laughs> that was like a bad joke, I'm sorry. But uh, no, koans are, sacred to me in a sense um and they're very much physical slash intellectual they're not i don't see koans as a visual a representation of a koan as a visual thing um so but i'll think about it <laughs> it's something to think about for sure okay well that was the end of the question list does anyone have anything else they'd like to ask before we end up for the evening I'm not seeing any waving. Oh, 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 here's a good one. It's a long one. All right. 
So from Aiden, it says, hello, Kenny, and thank you for your presentation. I found your works depicting birds very profound and haunting. Do you find your ability to capture birds in your gestural and abstract art style lends hope to the future of birds? It is almost as if the birds leave a lingering presence in your pieces and are never fully contained within your piece, reflecting a possible future where the birds are no longer bound to our human selfish dependence on controlling and monitoring the lives of these beautifully individual creatures. Hey, I'm, whoever you are, I'm stealing that. <laughs> I'm gonna put that. <laughs> it was very beautifully put. Um, and thank you that, that you see my birds, you know, in that sense. So yeah, I am um, constantly in awe of birds. If I, you know, I'm, I wanna be a bird. I wanna fly, I wanna have, I, that would be like the culmination of a great life. Uh, but, um, and I did, I have changed some people's minds. Um, uh, real early on, I did a show called For the Birds and um, it was about uh, uh, pigeons, I think. And lots of people came up to me and said, pigeons, I never look at pigeons. I'm all, like, I'm gonna look at, I wrote a little, a short story uh, that I published a while back about pigeons. And um, I think that I've given some people uh, a little bit of, of sense of city birds as not the things that are on the ground eating your crap, you know, that, uh, and uh, we are right now, it's right beginning, it's kind of in the beginning stages of one of the most remarkable things that happen on the planet, which is the spring migration of birds. They're heading north and you can go outside, if you can find a place with not a lot of light, you can see hundreds and hundreds of hawks overhead you don't need binoculars there's just like this cloud of of beauty that's flying over you there's if, if in any little tree any if in anybody's yard right now you're going to find a warbler you're going to find but you have to as howard rangel said you got to pay attention to what you're paying attention to and um so yeah look um friend of mine a long time ago said don't forget to look up <laughs> And it's so very true, being able to, to take the time to, as you say, pay attention to what you're paying attention to and see the beauty um, and the connection. And um, just thank you. And one last comment was um, from Dana. Fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, Kenny. Um, on that note, I completely agree, Dana. It's a fascinating presentation. And thank you so much, Kenny. Um, it was wonderful having you give the talk and, and speak more about your your work and how you got there and then the, the exhibition uh, in specific. So um, just once again, that we will have this up on YouTube and I definitely like the idea of doing the poem. So um, we'll, we'll get together and, and do that. And we'll, we'll put that up on YouTube and the webpage as well. Um, oh, <laughs> and um, Avi and Betsy wanna know when you do paint a koan to <laughs> let them know. <laughs> So, but on that note, we'll go ahead and close out. Um, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Oh, could you, could you just say, I will be in the gallery this Saturday. Oh, yes. Um, I'll be there. I'll be there from one to four. Yes. Uh, Saturday and then May 29th and June 5th. This all, all the information is on the gallery's website, but yes. um, it's a beautiful place to visit. It's a remarkable campus. It's huge. It's beautiful. Um, people should know more about it. So come and visit if you can. Yes, please do. Thank you. And as Kenny said, yes, all the information's up on the gallery website, which is the galleries at ccbc.com. Okay. All right. Thank you again. And everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye.